So welcome back to Dr. Deep State. I want to talk about fake news. And I came to this topic uh, by way of uh, questions and comments that we had. And I'm going to begin with a few of these comments and questions. The first one is from Richard Nixon, no Millhouse. So he asks about the idea of inversion. I dropped it in the last video. I believe I used the expression Talmudic inversion, and he wanted to know what I meant by that. Uh, John Smith wanted me to speak a little bit about controlled opposition, the sort of Alex Jones idea, how this can be used to discredit uh, other people or other topics. Uh, Fures class, sorry about the pronunciation, uh, he wanted to know about top insiders that are intellectuals, or are there some intellectuals that are not part of this program? And Ian wanted to know about Batelle and Pizzagate. So I'm going to pull some of these together and work through these by way of the topic of fake news. Now, fake news came into um, existence as a, as a meme during the election uh, fall of 2016, and almost overnight, almost by magic, uh, suddenly the internet was a place that was um, scary and sort of somewhat foreboding to go through for real information. So there is a sort of magic that happened when the idea of fake news came into existence, and that's the part that I want to explore. What is this sort of magic that happens in terms of the biopolitical idea of controlling our bodies, minds, and spirits? And it's a confusing topic, but uh, because of a couple great comments, I have some from um, some viewers uh, that's going to help me out a bit with that. So um, what did I mean when I said inversion? I had come... Uh, I had become acquainted with this term. I was talking about geostrategy and the way offense, you know, you're bombing somebody, you can call it defense. Um, John McMurdy had used that expression in one of his 9-11. And he was a famed Canadian scholar. Um, he used it, um, again, how can you really convince a mass of people that doing something is something quite different? Um, this is a good time to bring up the idea of um, intellectuals inside out. I don't know. The word intellectual is kind of confusing. And I'm not really concerned with whether or not somebody's an insider, but whether or not they have the freedom to speak their mind. He's just one excellent case. He was, because he was a top scholar, he was invited on shows following 9-11. And because he was truthful, he was, you know, he was shunned. He was, and that sort of sets the pattern. So other people are just not going to go there. They value their careers. They value, you know, they want peer reviewed articles. So that sets the tone of the type of censorship that goes about the people that want to promote the new world order. They're going to, you know, get to the frontal line. So that's more, you know, simply put how that tends to work in, in my estimation. Um, but what we're talking about here, when we're looking at information, we've always talked about oligarchy in replacing the idea of our worldview with democracy. We talk about oligarchs, who are they, how they operate. And one of the things they've always done is controlled information. And Plato's cave is a great uh, allegory for that. Um, so this is another, you know, this idea of telling us, you know, what's good news, what's bad news, which instead of uh, us relying on our own sense of reason, um, having experts tell us where to go and where to not go in order to find information. So we can kind of think of this uh, oligarchy, we call them the Venetian oligarchy. What holds them together, we've said, is hermetic Kabbalism that goes into Rosicrucianism all the way up to Theosophy. Um, but the Kabbalah um, is the one instrument that really holds this cabal together. So we could call it really a cabal of Kabbalists. And they do use a certain sort of magic in their biopolitics of control over us. So I want to explore that just a little bit in regarding the overarching topic of, of fake news here. So before I begin, I want to set a sort of foundation for how they've already um, allowed us to internalize a conception of the world that plays on our emotional um, perception of reality. 
And so we're going to call Pizzagate itself the information inversion psyop. And so in doing so, we're going to see this idea of inversion, this uh, sort of biopolitical techniques and a little bit of magic that can may actually make people think that, you know, two and two is five, black is white, fake is real and real is fake. So I want to explore that idea. But part of this idea um, that's deep, uh, that's, that's interwoven deep inside our beings is this idea that human beings have a desire for idols. And the protocols of the learned elders of Zion says that we will manufacture your idols for you. We will give them to you. And that's going to be a critical idea in terms of how they can not only get a hold of your mind, but your emotions and how you're invested into a worldview. And you know, this is you know sort of long before Lippmann and Bernays talked about the more scientific techniques. It really rests in the idea of manufacturing your idols. And uh, you know, this is the antithesis of a biblical worldview of a, of a God that says, you know, don't have any idols because it's going to sort of guide you away from the creator. They're all about making and controlling those idols. And they've always said this, this goes way back before the Holy Trinity that we've uh, talked about, this idea that we will um, allow you, there's an inversion here, allow you to think that these, that there, it's your own choosing these people that you like them because you've not, okay. So <laughs> here's where we go. I'm about to present a, a series of figures, um, all of whom are part of advancing the agenda of this cabal of Kabbalists. James Perloff uh, had a book once where he said, truth is a lonely warrior. You know you must be onto something if you're basically pissing almost everybody off. So when you look at this group of people, if anybody were going to go about and say to anyone <laughs> that um, these people are part of the program or these people were literally manufactured and are controlled in order to advance this program, you're not going to have many friends. This is part of the magic of the control mechanism at the ground floor. So each one of these people, if you wanted to, you could go and explore their biographies, follow the money, and see those connections to the oligarchical class that we've discussed. The problem in the control is that people aren't going to do it in the first place. Um, once you you already have invested yourself, you've liked this guy, you've had or these people, you have a connection to them. When you find out that they represent or are controlled by something, another force that you uh, deem bad or even evil, of course you're going to have a co cognitive dissonance, and you won't even go there in the first place. You're not going to do the investigation. You don't want to hear about it. You're going to have so much truth, and that's it. That's where you're going to stop. So there's a powerful first layer to this whole thing when the oligarchs provide you with your heroes. And, you know, sort of Lippmann and Bernays would play on this idea. If we see people on a big screen, big stage, we sort of, you know, want to be them or share or bask in their reflective glory. So once we have these connections with these people, we don't want to hear, you're not going to walk around and say, why do you celebrate Martin Luther King Day? Don't you know he was an X, Y, and Z, and he was part of this? Nobody wants to hear that. <laughs> very bad form. So we've already got uh, we've already got this working against anybody that wants to um, shed light on um, the way the control system works. Likewise, if we're going to go into the world and we're going to tell people that all of these political players on the world stage are actually manufactured and controlled by the same oligarchical entity. There's very few people out there that are going to have an open ear to hearing that. Because, of course, there's good guys and bad guys and this drama. And nobody wants to see that, that these oligarchs are the playwrights. All the world's a stage to them, and it's politics for them is constant stage crafting and biopolitical control over our bodies. So this runs deep. And you know, there's maybe a handful of you out there that you know have explored things like uh, Miles Mathis, who goes through all the oligarchs of all this, you know, 
entertainment figures, uh, literature, art, politics, and kind of weaves them back to the same uh, set of family lines. Um, but it gets crazy if you go into religion, uh, from the Pope to the Protestants, anybody you're going to see on television, anybody of some note has a connection to this oligarchical class, and therefore they are controlled by them, what they can say, what they will do, and so forth. So this goes deep, and it's very broad in terms of the leadership. Now, sometimes it's as in uh, academics. You, some people just won't go there because they know it won't advance their career. In other cases, it's very much these people are um, lifetime actors, and they are playing a part and have been truly manufactured from the ground up. And um, we can safely say with religion, that they all have a worldview that they've infused this sort of Kabbalism into their Christianity and their parameters on what they can say and cannot say. And of course, one of the connections with this is, of course, the Masonic Lodge. That's a Kabbalistic uh, organization. And you know, if you belong to it, there might be benefits. But of course, you are a controlled entity. And so we're living in a phase where there's sort of an externalization of the hierarchy um, or part of the control mechanism is an actually, actually a, revolu a revelation of the method that it's even a further uh, enforcement of being our own police people that we have internalized. Um, but just to touch upon the idols again, that it's not enough that we have matinee idols and sports idols. They're sort of manufactured now on a weekly basis, uh, and the programming for them goes on ad infinitum. And it's not just in the United States. Uh, we see it in uh, South America, Europe, uh, the East. These shows um, are the are the you know the biggest thing. We they can't crank them out fast enough. And again, when we look at that notion of the idol, they sort of put it in your face, how it is this sort of, you know, it runs in contradiction to this um, biblical prohibition against it. So um, once we have that idea of an idol, we've sort of um, put our uh, foot in the door in terms of allowing ourselves to be controlled. And that is sort of part of the idea that Batelli is um, talking about here, uh, the French thinker. And he, he hints at this idea with the idols when he talks about a mixture of the sacred and the profane. And this is where it gets a little mis mystical, a little esoteric, um, that when we allow entertainment to um, imbibe us with these elements of the erotic and the exotic together. Again, this mixture, we're inclined toward idolism. But Bohem, uh, one of the thinkers that influenced Hegel, um, put it in sort of uh, a different, a slightly different way. So one of my respondents um, told me that um, they had uh, also read Hegel the Hermetic by uh, Glenn Alexander McGee um, and said that it was a very influential book on them. And they wrote this response. And I'm just going to read this for you. Um, but we define magic. And that's the ultimate form of mind and body control, right? Magic is that which creates itself out of nothing. And they say, but I don't know whether he ever stated the obvious corollary. Unless it is everlasting, then whatever creates itself out of nothing must also destroy itself for no reason. So, When I think of this in terms of the 9-11 attacks, I see Wall Street and the Pentagon, two epicenters of the deep state, which attacks itself for no reason, except to create something out of nothing. 
it must be an emulation of the hermetic god who creates ex dio et in dio who becomes manifest only as he annihilates himself of course this connects prima fascist says to uh, Sartre's, uh, Sartre's definition of being for itself as nothingness, or a type of negation. Um, or as Crowley said, definition of, the definition of magic as the science and art of causing change to occur in conformity of the will. And so I put that there, and you can read through it, and I've done it a couple of times, and I'm drawing little threads every time I read this fabulous comment. Um, by prima fascist. Uh, 